London, and the stage is set for an outing of celebrities. Famous actors, actresses and rock stars mingle with the good and the great. If this is the face of the celebrity scene, can these people truly be described as the new royals in the face of competition from a real royal like Prince William? On the world stage, who can compete with a young man who is handsome, rich and a future king? Despite their millions, Posh and Bex aren't in the same league. And how does Hollywood stand up to competition from a young prince? In a recent popularity poll, Prince William beat Robbie Williams. If the British royal family is sharing the spotlight with a new celebrity culture, in Prince William, they have a secret weapon. Relaxed and dressed in well-worn jeans, trainers, and a camel-colored sweater over a blue shirt, Prince William took on the world's press for the first time at Highgrove, the family home. Sport had been William's mainstay at Eton School, where he excelled in the swimming pool, winning the 50-meter and 100-meter freestyle competitions at junior level. His passion for water polo had helped him to plan for an expedition. I organised a water polo match and got sponsors and um, basically uh, did the money that way. And I also raised money for a disadvantaged person to come, on the, um, to come on the expedition with me. Had his father chipped in? Um, you might have helped slightly. <laughs> Not very much. Though. I chip in all the bloody time. <laughs> He's great. He's that new injection of youth. He's that new injection of the new generation. He has the magic of Diana. He has the gravitas potential of his father. He has the longevity of reigning possibility of his, of his grandmother. And he has the magic star quality of his great-grandmother, all really in bud waiting to be. This star quality made William number six in a poll of the top most eligible bachelors. Americans claim that he has the good looks of a film star, the charm of a young Robert Redford, and will go down great in America. There was something very solid about having royalty as your, at the, the pinnacle of glamour, because there was a sort of solidity, a continuity about it. What you're seeing now is very much a kind of fly-by-night celebrity. If the competition is fly-by-night, then it's certainly rich. At the last count, Posh and Bex were millionaires 50 times over but they can still be proud of their humble beginnings. They're from the people, but clearly not of the people because they are now enjoying an enormous celebrity status. Uh, how long that celebrity lasts, of course, is another matter. The royal family tended to stay in the public eye for, you know, for decades. Uh, the new kind of celebrity tends to be here and then next week you've never heard, them, heard of them again. I mean, it's a very, very, very fast turnover probably reflecting the, the changes in society itself. The appeal of people like Posh and Beck is, first of all, they do something. One's a footballer, one's a singer. They've carefully marketed themselves as a glamorous couple, as glamour is perceived today. The answer to Posh and Beckham's success is, uh, in one word, synergy. They are both young and gorgeous and rich and successful. Um, the two of them individually probably wouldn't be as powerful as both of them together as a couple, they're knockout. People make jokes about how stupid they are, but there they are, they've actually made a huge fortune between them. And they're a glamorous looking couple. The great advantage which Posh and Bex have over the royals is they can sell their story. OK or hello will pay them a lot of money, and we're talking six, sometimes seven figure checks. If any of our royal family did that, there would be outrage and debate. Princess Diana generated an aura of interest wherever she went. Has a famous footballer married to a pop singer filled the vacuum left by her? I don't feel that Posh and Bex will last as long as Diana, even in her death. These stars are more, are more transient. Diana was everlasting and still is. Um, I, don't, I don't think they've taken her place, but they are a, a sort of minor substitute. They are not the Burton Taylor, they are the sort of Robert Wagner, Natalie Wood. Yeah, it's quite brilliant, huh? 
Fueled by the demands of the celebrity media, even a mundane departure of a pop star at Heathrow is an event worth recording. This occasion, though, had an added news spin. Liam Gallagher had threatened to punch fellow performer okay, Robbie no, Williams. Is this going to beat me up? That's right, yeah. Uh, uh, um, so I'm not, I'm not angry enough to hit him. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not my career that's going down the pan. Robbie Williams is the ultimate performer, I think. He is young and good looking and has been in the industry for a long time, so he knows what he's doing. He is um, very exciting and cheeky chappy, and he's a great, great star. Great covers do wonders for circulation. To boost their sales, Vogue magazine put a naked Robbie on the front. Sex sells everything. The sex in the Olympics, the sex in every advert on television, everything seems to have a sexual connotation now, and Vogue have gone for it too because they want to sell magazines. Sex sells. When you see a magazine like Vogue, getting into this kind of popular culture with Robbie Williams virtually naked on the front cover, you know that the rules by which celebrity is operated have changed. And Vogue are having to follow the rules. The rules are the newspaper, the magazine buying public. This is what they perceive as glamour. Vogue has always been associated with glamour. This is the new glamour. Princess Diana was the glamorous face of royalty and paid a heavy price for the media's constant attention. Without her now, the royal family has retreated from the constant glare of publicity. The royal family are delighted that the media are defocusing on them, if indeed they are. They don't want to be celebrities. They've never enjoyed the celebrity status. Most of them are not photogenic enough to be true celebrities. You're not going to get Prince Philip posing on the front of Vogue magazine. <laughs> holding some naked girl in his arms as much as he might enjoy it. Naked pop singers may have filled the vacuum left by Diana, but her legacy is with William, whose dashing good looks gaze out from magazine covers with groovy baby slogans reminiscent of an Austin Powers movie. William will become a Vogue cover boy. He will be a cover boy. He's very handsome, he looks like his mother, and yet he, he, there's something rather mysterious about William uh, and something that he doesn't let us know about him, which of course is intriguing. He's a Hollywood film star. Prince William is a dashing young polo player. Is this another secret weapon in the armory of royal marketing? The interest in royalty as a whole has gone down um, with the exception of Prince William. I think um, tabloid editors now openly say royals don't sell copies, which is amazing. If you think 18 months ago there were people fighting to have a position outside a front door of a royal palace in order to get a picture or a quote or some little snippet of information in order to boost circulation of newspapers and magazines. That is not the case anymore. A Heathrow departure for Britney Spears became a news event when her publicity machine linked the pop singer romantically to Prince William. There is a, a, a sort of sense of who do we have next, um, and people have tried to make it fulfilled with film stars, Catherine Zeta-Jones or Uma Thurman, um, or even Kylie Minogue, um, or Britney Spears, God bless her, who's, who's erroneously linked with Prince William. So there you have Hollywood and you have both sorts of royalty sort of connecting in a spurious way. It doesn't quite work. Um, of course, she's hugely popular, Britney, and she's great but she doesn't have that um, all-embracing popularity across ages, across nations, which royals did. All-embracing royalty may be missing out, but the shenanigans of celebrity culture has an eternal fascination. We all like to know what's going on and who's doing what to whom and in whose bedroom they're doing it. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a, a big part of all our makeups that we really love to know uh, all the sordid little details. And we might turn around and say, oh, I couldn't possibly watch and see or, or do anything like that, but we really do want it. The Venice Film Festival. The stars come out to promote their latest movie. What lies beneath this event is the promotion of a product created for people's enjoyment and satisfaction. The images are good, the message is clear. Oh, 
Sex was on display too in London, in front of a frenzied press. When Hugh Grant was apprehended by the Los Angeles Police Department in a well-publicized indiscretion with a prostitute in a car, the event had a very positive effect on the career of his partner, Liz Hurley. She has admitted that his misdemeanor rubbed off on her Hollywood career in a very positive way and made her more famous. Newspapers have led the way in this redefining of what is important, what is significant. You could also argue just as easily that this is what the, the public now expects from their celebrity. They want to be told who the latest girlfriend is. They deem it to be of great importance. They are fascinated by the fact that Prince Charles, or indeed as will undoubtedly happen, Prince William has a new girlfriend. When it does, it won't be the third story in a gossip column. It'll be the top story on the page one of half the newspapers of this country. At Heathrow Airport, singer Diana Ross suffered the ignominy of being caught on camera after being detained by police. The police were very good, but they have procedures. It's devastating to be in a police station. I've never been in one before. I was very frightened. And I was stayed there from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. But I'm not saying that they weren't unkind, but they did their jobs. It was scary. I was scared. And I'm worried about my children. I want to go home. The one thing that happens to all celebrities is that when they get to the superstar status, they tend to think that they are more important than they are and forget where they actually came from. And that's why you will find a celebrity, whether it's a, a, a show business star or a royal, who gets to a status and thinks, thinks that they are really important and they forget and uh, then that's suddenly they want to be private. You know, they, after basing their life on seeking and cultivating publicity, suddenly they want to be private. And that's mainly their downfall. You know, they suddenly want to shut themselves away. Well, there's usually a reason why they want to shut themselves away. And it's usually because that they're up to some naughty business somewhere. And they don't want us to find out about it. But we always will. In the public's mind, being a celebrity is not about being ordinary and suffering the regular indignities of daily life. It's about escapism. The real world's the one we're living in. You know, the real world's the traffic jam, you know, rushing for the bus, the train, uh, whether the, the wage pack is going to come through in a week or a month's time, or whether you're going to have a job. That's the real world. So it's, it's nice to read about other, other kinds of culture, other backgrounds. It's exciting, and you really want to know about all these people. I mean, the fact that Mrs. Jones down the road is having an affair, who gives the monkeys? But if it's Robbie Williams or Kylie Minogue or Posh and Bex or a member of the royal family, well, it's, you know, it's what people want to talk about. And should they be with that person? I mean, look at all the Charles and Diana scenario. I mean, we had the country divided as to whether, you know, Charles was right to leave Diana, whether he should have stayed with Camilla. You know, pe people wanted to stone Camilla to death in the streets. You know, it's a great talking point. Haunted by the endless images of his mother being hounded by the press, Prince William thanked the media for leaving him and his brother Harry alone to enjoy their school days. They've been very good. I was, um, I was a bit um, anxious about how everything was going to turn out, but thanks to everyone, it's been, it really has been brilliant. They've all left me alone at the beginning. The whole of Eton made a real big difference with everyone not trying to sort of snap a picture every time I was walking around the streets, and I hope it just continues for Harry as well when he's there. He thanked the press for being quite understanding. Um, he clearly must be haunted by the endless images of his mother, the repetition of, of gossip, the non-stop interest, some good, some bad, um, and to be, have an icon um, who will never age, like his mother, always there in, his, in, in the background, is not easy, particularly when it's your mother. The new aristocrats enjoy the full privilege and wealth of their success. Prince William, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, is already a millionaire many times over, a small price to pay for his celebrity status.
However, constant public scrutiny does carry benefits, particularly for his friends, who enjoy a royal patronage like nothing else on earth. Being close to or a member of the royal family is almost like having some kind of magic dust all over you. You can be as famous as you like, but if you are, if you have a, a title or are in with the royals, then it's then it's that little bit extra that really makes it special. Tara Palmer Tomkinson on the right has been showered with magic dust. Her family are very close to Prince Charles, close enough for her to be photographed on his arm during a skiing holiday. Using her royal connections, Tara elevated herself to become an it girl and succeeded in grabbing the headlines. Tara Palmer Tomkinson is the perfect example of somebody who has become famous just by uh, being associated with the royal family. She comes from a, a wealthy family and had access to all the right places. She's good looking, a lot of men found her very attractive, a lot of women found her very interesting and wanted to know what she was up to and all of a sudden she's everywhere. <laughs> But the press turned on Tara when a story emerged that she was using her royal connections to get publicity with claims that she'd slept with Prince William. I think a lot of people thought that it was a way of bringing attention to herself and reminding everybody how close she is to the royals to say that she hadn't slept with him. Tara's misdemeanors slipped her into alcohol dependency and drugs abuse questioning the quality of certain young, rich people who associate with Prince William. A lot of the young, moneyed uh, Trustafarians, they're called, find themselves getting into drugs because they've got lots of money, lots of time on their hands, and no reason to get up early in the morning. And eventually, I think they get bored and get sucked into that whole lifestyle. Tara Palmer Tompkinson is a classic case of this. She went to so many parties and busy all day. It's um, hardly surprising at all that she got involved with drugs. However, it's possibly the worst thing she could have done because the royal family are terribly frightened of anybody close to William, especially being involved with drugs, and immediately wanted to get her as far away from him as they could. Unlike his father, William has never experienced the emotional deprivation of a royal upbringing, so he has no reason to look on it as doing him any harm. But within the royal family, there is a history of addiction, and some younger members have experienced hard drugs. Of course, drugs is an issue for the royals, for everyone. Um, some of his friends have been um, occasionally taking cocaine, not on a regular basis. Um, they've been rather caught in a bit of gotcha journalism by, the, by some of the newspapers, um, and have all, on the whole, come forward and said, look, we took it. We're not going to take it again. There's always concern that Prince William will, will get caught up in a bad circle. I think he hasn't. He's been very sensible. His friends are incredibly loyal. Prince William's mother was an undisputed royal fashion icon and supported the British fashion industry on many occasions. mother's absence, Prince William's cousin, Lord Frederick Windsor, one of the new young royals, has taken over and become an attractive royal fashion icon. Freddie Windsor is definitely a sex icon. He is um, young and gorgeous and linked to the royal family. The image is a certain amount of conservatism and you have to have a certain amount of that sort of chic, handsome, good look, then Freddie Windsor doubly qualifies. The fact that he is royal adds even more cachet to something that wants to be a cachet with class. If you've got a handsome person with the cachet of class, it helps his career too. I think he's a terrific model. I mean, he looks young, sexy, um, and has a whole model essence about him. There's a charisma. He, um, he is very good looking. He, he plays well in front of the camera. And that has been you know, to his advantage. Nice to have a little bit of pocket money. 
um, and nice to show, again, a modern, modern face of royalty. Dressing up comes naturally to Lord Freddy. Even at his sister Lady Gabriella's christening in 1981, his mother, Princess Michael of Kent, made him look quite cute. Years later, Lord Freddy and his sister wore eye-catching clothes to a fancy dress party. On royal occasions, their mother cuts the elegant image of a grand princess. Nicknamed Princess Pushy by the press, she's very ambitious for her daughter, who has recently launched herself with a series of attractive photographs. She has um, al allowed some of her own love of um, razzmatazz to rub off on them. Gabriella Windsor, we've seen go to America, perhaps to escape the limelight. You know, it's easier to be in America um, if you're a minor royal, um, where people probably don't even know who you are. And so that's quite refreshing for her. I, I think Princess Michael is, is an ambitious, um, confident woman who likes to take opportunities. Um, I think she will wish the best for her children on that way. The young and beautiful Lady Helen Windsor, another new royal, was married at Windsor Castle in 1992. Wearing a dress designed by Catherine Walker, one of Princess Diana's favorite designers, she is a gracious member of the royal family. Soon after her wedding, she attended the marriage of Lord Linley and stood out with her style and elegance. She's a beautiful girl who has very simple, clear taste. And she's, she's aligned herself commercially to uh, Armani. Um, pr prior to that, with, with Calvin Klein. These very discreet commercial associations, which means she then you know, where's, where's their stuff? They, they're happy because um, it gets photographed. I mean, it's, it's a nice little circle of um, everyone, everyone being happy. Looking smart, Lady Helen Windsor attended the wedding of Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, another new royal and the daughter of Princess Margaret, who accompanied her mother and father to the wedding of her brother, Lord Linley. Forty years earlier, Princess Margaret had been a royal bride herself when she married Sarah's father, then the society photographer, Anthony Armstrong Jones. Now divorced, misfortune and ill health has dogged Princess Margaret in her solitary years. Princess Margaret was the big star in this country, and people forget now how beautiful she was. She had a 19-inch waist, great big movie star mouth, she was a nightclubber. I think Princess Margaret was a fashion icon and um, a total celebrity in her day. She looked incredible in the Norman Hartnell pictures that I have in a scrapbook somewhere. She was photographed all over the place at the 400, at the embassy, and she always had an element of darkness about her, which made her more of a celebrity. She was the younger sister. She was looking for a happy marriage. And then after the Townsend affair, she became a true celebrity because she had tragedy attached to her. And there were pictures of her in the papers every single day with all various lovers and boyfriends. And she was actually more beautiful than Diana. A figure of glamour in the 50s um, and, and 60s with mustique and you know, looking so elegant. And she was one of the most beautiful women in the world in her time. And I think there was a, there was a sort of residual affection for her, despite her slight like, grumpiness and touchiness and, you know, and the, the many stories about her not behaving perhaps as well as she should. Princess Diana attended Lord Linley's wedding alone. Once a new royal herself, she was now divorced from Prince Charles and coming to terms with life on the outside. I'm almost certain she would have ended up a lonely and sick person, which is very sad and perhaps a little unfair, but I think she wouldn't have found happiness with any man. Um, even if she'd married a local farmer, I think she would have been deeply unhappy, and I think she would have been very lonely if she had been a different sort of person and could have just done her charity work and gone on her missions and sort of saved the world, which in a way she was trying to do. That would have been wonderful, but there was so much problem inside her and in her head. I don't think she had the capacity to be truly happy for any length of time. Life on the outside for young royals like Princess Margaret's daughter Sarah, a talented artist, seems preferable to life on the inside. Sarah Armstrong-Jones wants to be 
a celebrity. She's a very good artist and she's had a certain amount of celebrity for that, but I think she has seen what it's done to her mother, what it's done to her uncle, uh, and certainly she, she wants to keep as low key as she can while still promoting herself as an artist. So they've all got an upside to it. Lord Linley, Princess Margaret's son, is fortunate to be born royal. He graduated as a carpenter. He is actually a master craftsman. The, I mean, he sells um, desks which go for £150,000. They are with Roman coins into the handles. I mean, the marquetry, the craftsmanship, they take sometimes a, a year and a half to make something. They, they hire um, an incredible amount of craftsmen. They give employment to a lot of people. They boost Britain by showing it as, as a place where um, the traditions of Chippendale um, can continue. English traditions stretch beyond Chippendale furniture, and through royal patronage, the new royals are accused of using their enviable position for commercial gain. I think one of the most intriguing things that we've seen over the last few years is the way that some of the younger royals have used their royal position to generate uh, a commercial industry for themselves. Viscount Linley uh, is a very talented carpenter, but it certainly helped him, the fact that he was Princess Margaret's son. So to an extent, I think they are doing something which was never ever done in the past, which is they're commercializing their royal background. I think everybody uses their position to benefit themselves. What else have you got? I don't think they can be blamed for that. I don't think you can actually differentiate the two. If you've got royal blood, and you want to promote yourself, that is going to be something that people are going to use. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way life is. I don't think they can be blamed for that. The Queen's youngest son, Prince Edward, married Sophie Rhys-Jones to become the Countess of Wessex, the latest new royal. Why was she hailed as the new Princess Diana in the royal family? Basically, they're all boring. Uh, it's as simple as that. There isn't anybody who is a tall blonde with blue eyes and got long legs and holds babies and cuddles AIDS victims and, and takes up causes for the disadvantaged. Uh, there isn't anyone like that. We had hopes that maybe Sophie Rhys-Jones, uh, uh, when she became the Countess of Wessex, might have stepped into that vacuum. But to be quite honest, you know, Sophie was never, uh, is not a match for Diana. The logical person to replace Diana as a fashion icon is Sophie Rhys-Jones, who I think is in a very difficult position because she'd only have to show a bit more extrovert personality and she'd be accused of being Princess Diana. And I think that the royal family will go out of their way now for something like that not to happen again. And I don't believe that there will be anyone who could fill that role until we have the lady Prince William finds. I think that will be the new Diana. His mother was brought up with the ideal of being a fairy princess, whereas he isn't brought up from back of beyond thinking he's a fairy prince. He can see the other side, and if anything, I think it will make him more wary of what he's going to do. A public relations executive before she became the Countess of Wessex, Sophie worked to gain maximum exposure for her clients. As a member of the royal family, she still works in PR, raising questions about commercial advantage. To a lot of companies, having someone like the Countess of Wessex gives kudos. Uh, it also opens the possibility, of course, that you may actually be able to get royals in on your product, which is, of course, rather helpful when it comes to pitching for a new client. Getting royals involved in his product helps Prince Edward. As an independent television producer, he courts bad publicity and is criticised for using his royal connections to get work. Prince Edward, who's supposed to be a TV producer, I mean, the only successful TV programmes he's made have got connections to do with the royal family. Well, any TV producer, any journalist who's got that sort of uh, inside uh, knowledge and help. If you've just got to ask your mum to open up the books and let's have a look at it, well, clearly you, you can't make a programme that's not going to be successful. Uh, but it's, he's, he's made other programmes. His famous Annie's Bar, based on the House of Commons, bombed. It's very difficult to shed bad publicity, and bad publicity breeds bad publicity, and they need some good 
opportunities and maybe the child if a child hopefully a child comes will be a watershed where we will see Prince Edward and, and his, and his um, wife Sophie who's, who's lovely really nice straightforward girl who is um, I think going to be rather a, a secret weapon of the royal family Princess Anne has kept her royal powder dry by maintaining her celebrity status through a mixture of common sense and pragmatism. Princess Anne is a remarkable lady who has risen above her royal celebrity to become uh, a pillar of what we would regard as the very best of the royal family. I think her achievements have been remarkable. We, we all used to hate her 20 years ago. We used to think she was awful. She was rude, obstreperous, unattractive. Now, I think there's, most people in this country would regard her with great respect. She's what the royal family should be. She's what the royal family might have been had it not been for Diana and Fergie. Princess Anne's daughter was christened Zara Phillips. From the start, Anne wanted her children to be relieved of the burden of royal titles. Zara is the modern face of new royalty with an interesting future. I don't think Anne's children want to become celebrities, but they're semi-celebrities already. They are gorgeous children. They're very level-headed, they're ordinary, they don't have titles. They are the way forward. I think that Zara will definitely become a celebrity. Zara Phillips is seen as a wild one by the press. They long to make her into the wild child of the um, royal family, the one with the studied tongue, the one who um, goes abroad and has rather glamorous um, um, romances um, or links with, with rather glamorous looking, looking boys. We've had a, a few tickles at stories about you know with a, a relationship boyfriend Richard Johnson to a four hundred pound a night hotel in Mauritius. She's rather like her mother. She's she loves horses. She loves the outside world. She's pretty down to earth and straightforward. I think there's only one real star in that family at the moment, and that is Prince William, which is extremely difficult for him to deal with. I think Zara Phillips might be creeping up on him, it, and I have a feeling that Zara might take on quite a lot of royal duties and I think that they possibly see Zara as helping William because he really doesn't enjoy the celebrity that he has even at this stage. He's a very private person and I think he's going to have problems with dealing with the media interest. As new royals, palace officials view Diana and Fergie as a continuing danger to royal stability. Sarah Ferguson married Prince Andrew in 1986 and became the Duchess of York. But as new royal, she was accused of being a loose cannon, and the woman who plunged the crown into crisis and bringing shame to the royal family. Following their divorce, Andrew behaved with great civility to his estranged wife, believing that the happiness of their young daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie, came first. Fergie's downfall was prompted by her love for rich, handsome Americans. First, there was the dashing Texan, Steve Wyatt. Then his friend, Johnny Bryan, followed. Brian claimed that he was an honest broker, helping Fergie with her marital and financial problems. The papers told a different story. The indiscretions of previous royal generations had been covered up. Fergie found, like Diana's, that hers were exposed. She was a celebrity. Fergie made herself a celebrity because she did everything wrong and she became the sort of celebrity who's always slipping on a banana skin, which people love. And they were beastly about Fergie. They criticised her madly. And the more criticised she was, the more of a celebrity she became. And now she's cashing in on those years by being a huge celebrity in America. And she turned her nose up at the establishment. And she said, well, I'm going to do this and that and the other. And I just, that's too bad. If they don't like it, I'm going to get on with it. And people admired her, but they still criticised her. And I think they always will criticise her. She's not loved in this country. I mean, everybody said Fergie's stupid, but I don't think anyone can be that stupid that manages to make the amount of money she's made. I think she's become very, very canny. She always was quite canny about money. Fergie used her royal connections to sell her literary endeavours, while men and money were the reasons for her fall from grace. Celebrity status for royalty goes with the job. While life in the goldfish bowl has its compensations, a vigilant press keeps a watchful eye through the glass. With the royals that uh, everybody likes to see what the Queen and her family are up to, they hate people like us. Uh, they would, the Queen Mother would rather have nothing ever come out about the royal family. You don't see or hear anything about the 
facts. They load the dirty washing in public. We, we love it, you know, and the, the readers love it. The viewers love it. They, they love to see it. It's a world that normal people, you know, who have normal day-to-day -day jobs, they don't live in that life. But it's, it's nice to get a partial involvement in seeing it through the eyes of the papers or the television. Media interest in the marriage of Diana and Charles lifted the veil of royal mystique, seriously damaging the institution of monarchy. I think that, um, like it or not, the royals are surrounded by publicity, and I think that someone like the Queen, who was luckily brought into the, the limelight at an early age, and I really admired her throughout the whole of that Princess Diana thing because I'm sure she was probably in tears behind the scenes. But at every ounce of Queen, she didn't comment, she stayed behind the doors. People might be criticizing her, they might be saying the Queen says this, the Queen says that. No one knew what she really said. But the fact that she didn't say anything made her even more of a Queen. Spice Girls, in the top ten of the celebrity pay charts, each earn more than £6 million every year. At their movie premiere, looking like five checkout girls on a riotous hen night, they welcome the news media and grab the opportunity to expose themselves. Three years ago we planned this movie. Really, really, really excited about having this here as well. What's the film about? A bit of excitement, a bit of fun. It's like when you go to the cinema, you want a bit of escapism. This is entertainment. And for all you adults that's got a great sense of humour, we really take the mickey out of ourselves and you, the media. Anyone that's on television becomes a star because television is the new age. And I think it's, I mean, you have soap stars on television, I, I think it's hugely influential, much more so than newspapers. Pop culture dominates the celebrity world, and during her life, Diana enjoyed its attention. Charity events were an opportunity to dress up and meet the stars, even if her husband did look a bit stuffy. Diana brought a new image to royalty. As an attractive princess, her pulling power was unique event organizers scrambled to invite her. Whenever she or, or there was an event organized, a charity event, you had the coming of Diana to that event, and uh, you know, you name the showbiz celeb, uh, uh, and they were there. I mean, it was a great A-list. You know, she turned up at a premiere, practically every celeb who was worth his salt would be there. And so you, it, it's all show business then. It's all, you know, uh, razzmatazz, because you've got the two great forces, haven't you? You've got the sexy side of royalty coming out and the sexy side of show business coming out. And those two together, well, it's no comedy, you can't beat them. Diana's celebrity status reached an impressive climax in 1985 during a visit to Florence. Since her marriage into the royal family, Diana had matured from a shy teenager into a new royal who became the centre of an obsessive fascination. Charles was there, but it was his wife that people had really come to see. Her instant success as a new royal clearly upset some members of his family. I don't think they really understood what they had, uh, what they had brought into the royal family. I think they saw this uh, very timid, shy girl you know, sit in, the, sit in the corner, eat your peas, shut up, don't do anything. Uh, we'll tell you when to walk, when to talk, when to do this. Well, that was all right, but suddenly, you know, as she kept coming out onto the streets, each time she kept coming out, more and more people were there. You know, until, you know, all you have to do was start a rumour that Diana was going to be around and thousands clogged out into the street. She would walk into a room, she would twang the braces of the Portuguese president, and that was that he was totally in love with her never mind his wife, she would sort of gently squeeze the hand of, of, of another president in some other country, and that was it. He was, he was also, uh, you know, a devoted fan, and all of it rubbed off well on Britain. It was like we got gold medals all the time with Diana. During a visit to America in 1985, Princess Diana caught the imagination of the American people. The fairy tale princess had come to town. Welcome to a grand banquet by President Reagan at the White House. This was a meeting of the stars. 
John, are you going to uh, dance with the princess tonight? <laughs> She'd like me to. Well, the royals have always been our Hollywood because in the old days we didn't have those wonderful square-faced, good-looking actors that, that they did in America. And people liked to look up to Hollywood because it was a fantasy, it wasn't real life, and they could lose themselves in it. So in a way, the worse their own situation was, the more that they liked to lose them in the fantasy of somebody else's life. The stairway to Diana's fantasy life began as a 20-year-old Lady Di. An early meeting with Princess Grace of Monaco brought the new royals together, briefly in life and in death. Tragically, they both died in car accidents. Princess Grace was definitely an icon because she was the ideal marriage of Hollywood and royalty. And again, she had a darker side to her. She had a drinking problem, she had affairs, her marriage wasn't the fairy tale it was made out to be. And she was stunningly beautiful, probably the most beautiful of all the royal princesses. And the meeting of her and Prince Rainier was like a movie. So she was really the greatest royal princess in terms of media interest. The film star side of royalty was often on display. During an early royal tour of Indonesia, Diana was an accomplished performer. The weather was hot and humid, which did not deter the royal couple. Appearances had to be maintained. With hindsight, we know that Diana was bulimic and not a happy person. Yet she did so much to project royalty in a good light. A recent book claims that she was forced to become a royal rebel due to a chronic feeling of rejection by her husband's family. I think Diana single-handedly changed the way that the British public perceives the royal family and not to the advantage of the royal family. I think that uh, she's brought the question of the royal family's future very much. It's now in the balance and I think that's a direct consequence of the the way that she redefined, broke the mould of the traditional image of the royal family. The long-term effects, I think, were, were still, they're still being worked out. Well, the royal family didn't know what they, had, what, what they had with Diana, and they were as guilty as Charles at that time of not being able to harness and use it for their own good, to help promote the royal family in, and show them it all in a good light. They wanted to stay in in their old style and stuffiness and not tell anybody anything. But she just swept all that away. That old style and stuffiness burst in 1996 with the divorce of Charles and Diana. Enter now a new royal, Mrs Camilla Parker Bowles. On a rare public outing, Camilla turned up dripping with diamonds and clad in a crystal encrusted Versace dress which Charles had paid for. It'll be a long time before we see Charles, Camilla, together or separately on the, the cover of Vogue magazine because the one thing that neither of them have is glamour. Prince Charles keeps his relationship with Camilla away from the public eye. But cynics claim that the out-of-bounds press arrangements used to protect his son are shielding his mistress too. Because you've got this exclusion zone around William, it therefore means it's more difficult to sort of try and look at stories of Charles and Camilla uh, because it's, it's, it's behind the scenes and so you've got to penetrate the William exclusion zone first before you can get to the other part. So I think the royal family is using that to sort of bring down the shutters on, on a, a great deal of other things. There are lots of conspiracy thoughts going on about, you know, is Camilla being pushed forward in a certain way? And yes, she is. Is, is, is the answer. I mean, there is obviously a concerted effort to try to make um, Prince Charles's girlfriend seem a, a, as acceptable to the public as possible. It makes life easier for him, it makes life e easier for her, um, and I suspect they will slowly win the war and there will be more and more acceptance as we just take for granted that she's there. Diana felt that the prospect of William becoming king weighed heavily on the young man. Others say that he doesn't dwell on his destiny. He does, however, protect his mother's memory. When the press cried betrayal, it was reporting a book written by Diana's private secretary, 
portraying her as a scheming, paranoid liar. These revelations coincided with his press meeting at Highgrove. In his first ever public response to a newspaper report, William, speaking calmly and clearly holding his feelings in check, was asked for his reaction to these allegations. Um, well, of course, um, Harry and I are both quite upset about it, that our mother's trust has been betrayed and that um, even now she's still being exploited. But um, I don't really want to say any more on that. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank Thanks you. very much. The pressure on Prince William to succeed as a new royal will weigh heavily on him as he continues with his studies at St Andrews University after a year travelling the world. A royal icon in the making, William stands out well against other cultural icons of his generation. In his natural environment astride a horse, images of a young prince demonstrating his polo skills during a school's tournament are worthy of any Hollywood movie. This is a new royal in the making. He's got everything, so when he comes, when you get the chance of seeing him in a situation which we are allowed to go to, then, you know, it, it's good, it will always make the papers. As he carries on, he's not yet on the royal treadmill, but eventually he will be carrying out official duties. The day will come when he'll find, you know, a young lady of his own. He'll be the one who'll be the total focus of attention. And if, and I, uh, if I had any advice for William, and it would be was if that happens and she turns out to be a stunner, you know, and a nice girl and everything else, and she starts taking over the publicity, well, don't make the mistake that your dad did. You know, just hang on in there because people will still love you as well. It's William's birthright to hang on in there. The new royal of all royals will be a demanding job for a young man as he comes of age. Constantly under the spotlight and never far from intense public scrutiny, he will need all the help he can get from his family and friends. To be king of, of England um, is one of the most strenuous jobs in that you're always going to be under the public attention and there is no way out of it. A movie star chooses to be a movie star um, and can always say, I retire. If you are the Prince of Wales's son, going to be king, you are going to be always under that spotlight. You're in a glass bowl. You have a drink of Coca-Cola. Everyone says, do we drink Coca-Cola? You wear shades, as he did at the Cartier Polo. Everyone said, do we wear these, these dark glasses? I um, mean, he has a, a girlfriend who comes from the north. Should, should we all move north? He has a girlfriend from the west. Do we all go west? Wow, what a pressure for a young teenager. <laughs> Unlike the culture of other new royals, Prince William must fulfill his destiny and one day become a king.